this is chapter 17, section 1. Um, in there, we're learning about how we get from our sequences of DNA, or our genes, to building the phenotypes of who we are, which is primarily made up of protein. So this talks about the flow of genetic information. We start with DNA. That's the sequences of a, T, G's, and C's that make <coughs> us all who we are. These are inherited by an organism and leads to our specific traits. How does it do that? It does that by dictating or controlling uh, the process of making proteins. And then we're going to talk about a molecule called RNA. I think we actually talked about that in the, one of the last ones. Um, RNA is an intermediary molecule that is involved in building our proteins. Uh, there's lots of different types of RNA. mRNA and tRNA are two of the ones that we talk about most frequently. And they're both involved in that flow of genetic information from DNA to protein. Uh, proteins are like the summary. Uh, proteins are the link between the genotypes, what your genes are, what are the, what's the sequence of your nitrogen bases, to what you're actually expressing or showing, your phenotype. Um, we do a chapter 18, we do a whole chapter on gene expression, um, because even though it's as simple as DNA building proteins, uh, there's also a little bit more to it than that. Um, how genes are actually physically expressed um, is, is another whole uh, step. So what was the first evidence for this? Um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, but alcapetoneuria Alcaton is a condition where the urine is black because of a kill chemical that darkens when it, it comes in contact with the air. But most people have an enzyme that actually metabolizes alcapetone, which is that chemical, and so we don't have black urine. The inability to make that enzyme is actually inherited in your DNA. Um, a gene, which is just a smaller sequence of DNA, dictates or shows how or controls the production of that enzyme. Um, <coughs> so not having that gene or having a mutated form of that gene will not produce that enzyme and the sheer urine will be black. Who knew? Uh, later on, we went a little further and realized that not all proteins are enzymes. Okay. Um, for example, keratin is not an enzyme, but it is an important part of your cells. And so it's insulin, which regulates blood sugar. That is also not an enzyme, but it is a protein. Oh. Um, and proteins are products of genes, regardless of whether they're enzymes or not. Um, we found that many proteins are made of two or more polypeptide chains. This just means a chain of amino acids. Um, the primary... Um, structure of a protein, which is the amino acid sequence. Um, so many proteins are made up of more than one uh, sequence of amino acids, and each polypeptide is specified by its own gene. We used to think that it was one gene, one protein, and um, later research realized that uh, one gene led to one polypeptide, which could combine to form a larger protein. For example, Hemoglobin, remember, is a protein that carries oxygen in your blood, actually is made up of two polypeptide chains, and thus two genes you have code for this particular po protein. <laughs> so we're going to talk a lot about protein synthesis, building proteins. Um, there are two basic steps to protein synthesis, transcription and translation. RNA is the bridge, or this intermediary molecule, between DNA and a protein. So it's usually seen like this, DNA, RNA, protein. Remember that DNA is in the nucleus of the cell. Proteins are made on the ribosome. So in order to get the message or the instructions, DNA, to the ribosomes to build the proteins, you have to have this molecule, this RNA, because DNA can't leave the nucleus. RNA is similar to DNA except that it contains ribose sugar 
and it's typically a single stranded or some kind of twisted form of that and contains uracil. Genes are typically hundreds or thousands of nucleotides long and each gene has a specific sequence of nucleotides. Okay, genes are what make us who we are. The sequences of A, T, G, H polypeptide of a protein also has monomers, or right, those are amino acids, arranged in a linear order. Transcription and translation are the processes to get from one language to another. And the first language is DNA, and the last language is our proteins. So transcription, in a summary of it, um, is where RNA is built from the information in the DNA. This RNA is actually mRNA or messenger RNA because it carries a message of DNA to the ribosome. That's where we're going to build the proteins. Um, this transcription happens in the nucleus of the cell, in eukaryotic cells, in prokaryotic cells. It doesn't because there is no nucleus. It happens in that nucleoid region. So here's what I'm talking about. Here's the nucleus. Here's your DNA right here and this DNA is just a specific gene one section of DNA remember DNA is really long if you actually stretched out your DNA oh it would be about the length of a car um, <coughs> so what they're going to do here is um, in transcription your cells are going to build something called mRNA now this is actually referred to as pre-mRNA uh, pre because when we talk about in chapter 18 gene expression, we're going to talk a little bit about how that mRNA, um, what happens to it before it becomes um, ready to leave the nucleus. I think we talked about that in chapter 18 if we don't talk about it in this chapter. So there's something called RNA processing. It's going to change it a little bit, but basically what you end up with is messenger RNA that is then ready to leave the nucleus. Okay, then we have translation. Then we have translation. This is the second part. This is actually building the amino acid sequence. Okay. The cell must translate what's in the mRNA into the amino acid. And this is going to happen on the ribosome. In bacteria, because there is no separation of DNA with the nucleus, translation can happen while transcription is still taking place. That's kind of interesting. They can do it at the same time because there's not that separation with the nuclear membrane. So it just shows the difference here in the bacteria cell versus the eukaryotic cell. So here the messenger and then it can go ahead and translate that while it's um, doing the uh, transcription part too. Here it actually, the mRNA has to leave the nucleus and then attach to the ribosome and then it can build the polypeptide. So here's the basic idea or big picture here. DNA, RNA, protein. These are your instructions. This is what you're going to be. Okay, that's going to be all the building blocks of you. And again, because it's a very important concept. This here is transcription. And this here is translation. We're going to talk a little bit about the genetic code when we get really deep into um, <coughs> protein synthesis. Um, <coughs> triplets, which remember means three. Nucleotide sequences, we call them codons, code for the amino acids. It's written in the five prime to three prime direction, and we talked about what that meant in our last chapter. Transcription of mRNA is anti-parallel to the DNA. Kind of like replication is, so remember it from our modeling of that. During translation, the codons, those three bases, are translated into a sequence of amino acids and are translated five prime to three prime along the mRNA. Remember that because you're gonna have to model this too. So here is your DNA. Okay, DNA is split in half. Okay, then transcription builds the mRNA. Notice that we're matching this side up here with this side. This is a 3 prime, this is a 5 prime. Match it up, remember, see, notice we're using U instead of T's. This is a codon. It's three bases on the mRNA. 
and this is actually going to code for an amino acid. There is a chart you can use to determine what this is amino acid is based on this codon. Now, there are three, every three bases is a codon, and there are 20 amino acids, which means, that if you're a math whiz, there are 64 um, possible combinations of, oh, sorry, no, um, sorry, three and a codon, and there are four letters um, in the genetic alphabet, I guess you could say. And then there are 20 amino acids possible. And so it ends up being 64 possible combinations, um, which means that there's 64 combinations of codons and there are only 20 amino acids. That means that some amino acids are going to have more than one codon attached to them. And you're going to see that when you get to the chart. Um, three, there are three codons that do not designate amino acids. They're stop signals so that we can end translation. So when the gene, here's gene here, when that gene is being done being read, it stops so that you don't continue to read on. Um, codon AUG is our start codon, and the amino acid attached that is methionine. Um, the reading frame is very important. This is where you get into mutations, and if you change the DNA, it's going to change possibly the reading frame. So, for example, if we say the red dog ate the bug, if you group these letters incorrectly, you could get her red oga tet heb ug, which makes absolutely no sense. And all we did with that was we went her, or sorry, her red oga pet, do you guys see where I'm getting this? Heb ug. So the reading frame is really important. If this didn't have the separation where it does, that sentence would make no sense. It's the same idea with um, your genetic code and your codons. If your mRNA is not read correctly, the wrong sequence will be made. Here's the codon chart I was talking about. Um, you'll see that, um, <coughs> for example, um, arginine is an amino acid. Arginine actually is attached to all of those bases there, plus these three codons. Um, I can't remember if arginine is attached to anything else. I don't think that's it. it. So there are um, 64 combinations here, but only 20 amino acids. And the way you read this chart is, say you have a DNA strand that is TAC. The mRNA would be A. U G. So the way you read this is the first base here, A. The second base is U. So you're going to come here where they meet, and then you're looking for the third base, G, here. And then you should find that here. Not all charts are going to look like this. Some of them are circular. Um, some of them don't contain this whole piece here. They just tell you the amino acid. Anyway, you can use them as long as you can find where it says first base, second base, third base. Um, the mRNA nucleotides must be read 5' prime to 3' prime in groups of 3 and are not overlapping. So UGG, UUU, and there's no overlapping here. Um, it's not going to be like this. They're not going to be all special. You, they read them 3 at a time. The genetic code is nearly universal. Experiments have shown that genes can be transcribed and translated after being transplanted from one species to another. This is actually really cool because it is so universal in all living things that you can actually take genes and express them in other living things. So here are um, <coughs> um, a pig and a tobacco plant both express, expressing sorry, a gene that makes jellyfish glow. And this one is actually a firefly, sorry but both glowing genes. Um, this piggy, um, you can see that when they um, put this gene into this pig, he is expressing that gene in his hooves and his snout. That's where the gene is active. Um, you have to remember that you have trillions of cells in your body and not every single cell is expressing every gene. 
um, which makes sense because the genes in your skin or the cells of your skin are going to need to express genes for uh, melanin or pigment production. But um, your nerve cells don't need to do that because they don't have pigment. Um, they're not trying to protect anything from UV light. So <laughs> you can easily see where a gene is expressed when you, when you transplant it like this. Um, I was actually lucky enough to get to see some of these guys when I worked at NU. Um, his, uh, one of our doctors, Dr. Prather, worked on things like this. Um, and it was really kind of cool to see them um, in person. They don't glow quite as much as pictures sometimes show. And that's it for this one. Um, but this was only the first section of chapter 17.